Physicists tell us that the universe is made up of all kinds of stuff, of matter, and from the tiniest atoms to the powerful, most powerful planet circling suns, there are tensions and forces at work in our universe. Gravity is one of those things, you know, to hold on to the earth. And, and uh, gravity, if we didn't have it, we would spin off of the planet. Yet, while, we, while it holds it here, it inhibits us and, and we fight against it. Wouldn't it be great if we could fly? Yeah. And within the universe, there are poles, we're told. Poles that either pull together or repel and push apart. There are also everywhere forces of friction, <clears throat> describing resistance when surfaces come together and into contact with each other is friction. Now, let's do a little experiment. Ready? So put down your pen, put down your paper, take your hands. Ready? Take your hands. Got them? Got two? Okay, good. Do this. Rub them together. Come on, harder. A little more vigorously. You got it? Come on. What do you feel? What's happening? Heat. Yeah. Friction. Hey, who said to stop? No, go ahead. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Okay, it's friction. It's there, right? When two surfaces heat up together or when they come together, there's some heat that's there. And you know what? In your personal relationships with other people and even with God, the same kind of thing happens, doesn't it? There are things in love and in families that at times pull us together. And at times, other times, other things repel us from each other. Have you ever felt poles apart from somebody you cared about? Or somebody there that you, uh, that you love maybe or that you work with? Do you ever find friction when you rub shoulders with those people who are close to you at home or there in that, in that neighborhood? Trotsky once said, if a man longs for a peaceful, quiet life, he's simply living in the wrong age. Not going to happen. Some are saying, I I wish I had no more tension. I wish there was none. I wish things were more peaceful. Well, you could move to another planet, but if you take even one person with you, it won't happen. It won't happen. Today, the seventh beatitude, Jesus says to us, read it with me. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So let's talk this morning about the blessing of being peacemakers today. You know, there are 22 epistles or letters in the New Testament. And of those 22, all but two of them either begin or end by saying peace to you or God's peace to you. Well, how does God's peace work when you're surrounded by tension and friction? How does that happen? Because that's life. Let's talk about, first of all, what does peace mean? Let's talk about the meaning of peace. Again, if you've got that uh, cherry-colored page there. The first thing that comes to mind when you think of peace is no war, right? Especially here on Remembrance Day. Or maybe just sitting down and putting everything into neutral You may say, well, peace is just, you know, vegging for 24 hours and and doing absolutely nothing, just checking out. Yeah, that's not good. That's not what peace is all about. Peace isn't being a, a vegetable and vegging out. No, it's not doing nothing. That's death. The Hebrew word for peace, you've all heard before, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. Thank you, Jordan. Teach us how to say it right. Shalom. Absolutely. It's the most basic word in the Hebrew vocabulary. And it means a lot of things. It means peace and harmony, wholeness or completeness. It means prosperity and welfare and tranquility. It can be used both to say hello and also to say... Okay, we're interactive here if you're... Same word can be hello and goodbye. It's such an important word today. Indeed, it's in the name Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city of peace, Jerusalem. And though this city has seen more war than any other city over the thousands of years, one day Jesus will come and he'll bring a lasting peace to that city. Now here's what the word peace means. You ready? Got your pen handy? It's a positive word. It's not a neutral word like the absence of war. It's a positive word. Okay, It's active. It means the presence of God's good 
as well. When someone says shalom, they're not saying, may you veg well. No, they're saying, may God's good things happen to you. Instead of evil things like conflict and trouble and war, may you have instead joy and peace with God instead of the evil things. So it's not only a positive word, but also in your notes, it's an active word. Peace isn't just doing nothing, not at all. Again, it means the absence of friction and tension while activity is still going on. How many of you drove here in a car today? Okay, or a van, or truck, or motor home, where's Alan? So you're here, that's great. Now, that engine that drove your car to bring you here has all kinds of moving parts. And most of them are metal parts and they're moving inside each other. It'd be crazy, the heat that's generated. So what do you do? What do you put into that engine? Oil. Oil, so that the friction and the tension is not so bad and it doesn't overheat, you know, and, and uh, that would be terrible. And we need God to help us because we can't just sit back and do nothing. We need to still be active and have relationships with people, but how is it that we can reduce that tension? How can we be peacemakers? Now, who knows what perpetual motion is? Anybody know what perpetual motion is? See, I was going to bring in my perpetual motion machine, but it quit on me. (laughs) Thank you, thank you. I tried. Okay, perpetual motion, it's the concept that motion and activity can go on indefinitely without using up any energy at all. Things just keep going forever. Now, we know that doesn't work in our world, right? Doesn't work. But God is perpetual power and activity. He's up there continuing the activity. He's not some grandfather sitting in a rocking chair up in heaven, not at all. He's involved in the affairs of the universe. The Bible says he made everything, he holds everything together. He's active too. And when you think of heaven, do you think it's a more peaceful place than my house? In your house? Sure. But when you picture heaven, do you think it's a place where everybody just lays around and sleeps all the time? No, it's going to be a great, wonderful place of joy. Amazing. Now, sometimes we think, I need to get away from it all if I'm going to find peace. I just need to get away. Maybe I'll run off to a monastery to get away from it all. But you get to the monastery, you'll find there are people there too, right? Even the monastery. I heard of a man who had such a difficult time. Life was just turning on him. It was horrible. And he thought he would join a monastery. So he went off and he came and he met, he was interviewed, and they said, look, you can, you can come, you can join us. You've got to follow our, our rules, no problem. One of our rules is you take a vow of silence. You don't talk. He was perfect. That'd be great. You know, he's just so tired. He said, well, if you're here 10 years, you can say two words, you know, and okay, great. So he came, he got his robe, he found out what his chores were, and he participated, great. Weeks, months, years went by. Ten years came up, and he was brought before the main monk, and he said, you've been here ten years. It's been wonderful to have you. Uh, you can say two words. What would you like to say? He said, bed hard. <laughs> okay, so, all right. Off he went back, you know, and kept working and doing his, his thing, part of the monastery. Great. Ten more years went by, and, you know, he came before the head monk. He says, hey, you've been here another ten years, twenty years. Something else you'd like to say? You have two words. Yeah. Food bad. Oh, my. Well, he went back out and he's sharing. It's great. He's working with everybody else. Days, weeks, months, years go by. Ten more years go by. He's been there 30 years. The, stands before the head monk. He goes, you can say two more words. He said, I quit. The head monk said, I'm not surprised. Ever since you got here, all you've done is complain. We can go off and join a monastery. It's still not going to change much. There's still people. How many of you have ever said, exclaimed the word people? Ever? Yeah? Guess what? We're people. And we're part of the issue too. Absolutely. Many complaints and tensions happen when we live and work with people because we're here on earth. Dr. Shishar a former Israel Department of Public Relations and Communications director, 
was once asked what he saw that could bring peace between Jews and Arabs in the Middle East. And he said, don't expect too much. We fought with each other for 3,000 years. I don't think it'll go that easily. Wow. Wow. The world, you see, doesn't have a way to offer true peace. It doesn't. After the Great War, 1914 to 1919, they set up the League of Nations so there would never be another war. How'd that go? Yeah, it went so badly that they actually renamed it World War I because now there was a World War II. Wow. And now we have the United Nations. Yeah, they're almost as inept. Goodness, the world doesn't have a solution. But God does. And we're going to talk about that here in a moment. Now, the Greek word for peace is Irene. Irene. So if you know somebody named Irene, her name means peace. Irene. And it basically means the same thing in the Bible. It has the same idea of God's activity on earth to bring about God's good for people. Now, Christians, I think we have a problem with peace sometimes. Because for one thing, we're reluctant to admit that we have conflicts. I mean, we're Christians. We need, you know, we shouldn't have conflicts. We shouldn't admit to that. But it's a world of conflicts, and we have conflicts as well. You can do a quick test. After the service today, go to Costco. Actually, never go on Sunday. But if you did, you know, like, like, Push your cart back up, get in line, wait 10 or 15 minutes to get up to the front, and then remember that you needed one more thing and ask somebody to hold your place for you. See if there's any conflict. Or better yet, just go get that thing and then try to go back to your same place. Yeah. How will that work? No, there's conflict, and it happens to Christians too. But God does want us to be actively bringing about good in the midst of all of that friction and tension and the polarities that are a part of this world. So don't deny them. They're there. Don't say, because I'm a Christian, you know, I don't have any conflict anywhere. No, of course you do. Everybody does. They're there in your home. They're there in your workplace. How do we become peacemakers? Let me give you a few key thoughts about peace first, though. Ready? Got your pen handy? Number one, peace is a fruit of the Spirit. It's one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace, amongst some other things. Absolutely. You know, one of the descriptors, one of the symbols for the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is oil. And so you often see oil, the oil of the Holy Spirit in your life. And I think that's interesting, that we have oil to reduce tensions and frictions, right? Like in that engine, to bring about a smoother operation of things. It's a description of what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in bringing peace for us. Because life, you can't just sit back and do nothing the rest of your life. you got to be involved and you need people, so we need the Holy Spirit to be there. And when you... Give that over to God, that relationship, that struggle, that tension. He can come and he can, if you will, lubricate a little bit between us and those other people to help us to understand them and them to understand us, bring more peace to relationships. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is in you and every believer has the Holy Spirit, that should be a fruit growing in your life. Number two, peace is a gift from God. It's a gift from God. John 14, 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I, what? Give you. I just give it to you. It's a gift. So stop trying to find peace. And so many people, you know, oh, whatever, you're going to find. No, you never find it. It's a gift from God when you know God. Reach out for the peace he wants to give you. Number three, peace is available first, primarily Through Jesus. Through Jesus. In Romans 5, we read this. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, our sins are forgiven, canceled, justified, we have, what? Peace with God through trying harder. No. We have peace with God through studying more. No. We have peace with God through, say it with me, our Lord Jesus Christ. When you have Jesus, when you've asked him to forgive your sins, 
Oh, the guilt is gone. God's peace can be there. That's the beginning. That's where it starts. Here's one that will surprise you. Number four, God's peace is not for everyone. Say what? Yeah, God's peace is not for everyone. The peace that God wants to give. That might surprise you, but let's have a look at a verse. You all know, it's all familiar. We're looking at a lot in a month. The angels are talking to the shepherds about how Jesus has been born in Bethlehem. And we read, they said, Glory to the God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now, I grew up in the old days, and the King James Bible, and it said, Peace on earth, goodwill towards men, right? That's actually a bad translation 400 years ago. But indeed, those looking for God's goodwill, those looking for God, will have his favor on them. And what does he give out of his favor? He gives them peace. Peace comes. But honestly, to those who are avoiding God, who are avoiding his goodwill and his good pleasure, they're not going to find his peace because they're not looking for it. They don't deserve it. They won't have it because they're not looking to the place excuse me, where it comes from. One more thing about peace. Peace actually is a byproduct of a rightly focused mind and heart. You can't just say, I'm going to have more peace. I'm going to have more peace. I'm going to have more peace. That doesn't work. It's a byproduct of your life focused on God. Isaiah says this, you, God, you will keep in perfect peace, complete peace, every area of your life, those whose, what? Minds are steadfast because they do what? Trust in you. If your mind is focused on God, okay, and you're trusting in him, you'll have his peace. Your mind is on him. You know what? If your mind is on everything else all around the world, if your mind is on how that person gypped you, how this person ripped you off, how this person is mean to you, if your focus is on everything else, you're not going to have God's peace. You need to focus on him And ask him how you deal with all these things. Because if they're unfair, they're unfair. And we'll talk about how we deal with those things in just a moment. There'll never be peace in your mind or relationships coming from the world. Peace comes after we focus on God. It's a byproduct of that right relationship with him. Now, the Beatitude says, Blessed are the peacemakers. Let's talk about being peacemakers for a moment or two. Now, Jesus did not say, blessed are the peace lovers. He didn't say, blessed are the peaceful people. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Does that sound like an active word to you? Peacemakers? That's absolutely active, and that's what we're called to be. Now, let's talk about those. Number one, Jesus didn't say, blessed are the peace lovers. The people that they only want peace, they want peace at any price, they will ignore things going on and put their head in the sands because they don't want to cause conflict, they don't want to disturb the peace at all. It's tough. They don't want to face conflict or deal with struggles or, or handle the problems that are there. Actually, if you don't actually address your problems, avoiding conflict often makes them worse. Who has experienced that? You ignore it, it doesn't go away. Put your head in the sand, it doesn't disappear. There are things we actually need to address. Uh, We face things daily. And God says, don't just ignore them. Don't pretend they're not there and they'll go away. That doesn't happen. And some people, I think, even in the name of their Christian faith, have avoided problems that should be addressed in your home should be addressed at your workplace. So being a peacemaker doesn't mean that, that you just ignore and avoid things. You want peace at any price. That's not what it means at all. There are things that should be addressed, for sure. It doesn't say, blessed are the peace lovers. Number two, peace, and for some of you, you need to hear this this morning, peace is not always possible. It's not always possible. The Bible says, If it is possible, live at peace with everyone. So the implication there is peace is not always possible. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you. Ah, so God calls you as a believer to be a peacemaker and do your part. Amen? 
But sometimes, we've all had the experience, you've reached out to somebody else and they've rebuffed you. True? They've said, nope, forget it. I don't want anything. Nope, sorry, we're done. It's over. God wants you to know that he calls you to be a peacemaker. And sometimes it's not possible, as long as you're doing everything on your side, to forgive. Now, there are a million rabbit trails we could go down. There's a difference between forgiveness and trust. Right? You forgive that person, you do your part. That doesn't mean necessarily you trust them, you know, but you forgive them. Okay, quick, set that aside. Peace is not always possible, but if you've reached out, if you've forgiven, if you've done your part and the other person refuses, you don't hold any guilt to that, okay? You don't. You're doing your best to be a peacemaker. Number three, being a peacemaker, put a star beside this, this is most important. It begins with you. It begins with me. Some of you, well, it begins with my personal inner peace with God. Peace begins inside me. Some of us are so cantankerous at times because we're all upset on the inside. And because we don't have peace on the inside, we disturb things. We're not happy. We cause troubles on the outside. Now, that's tough. James 4 says that the wars and conflicts on the outside come from a conflict on the inside of us. Look what he says. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? So until I get my heart and my life, my relationship with God right on the inside, there's going to be trouble on the outside. It's the way it works. It starts. So let me ask you, here's the challenge. I want to challenge you to look at your own inner peace first before this afternoon you start looking at all the places where you have conflict and addressing them. Address what's on the inside first. Does that make sense? That make... Is it too warm in here? You sleep? Yeah, absolutely. It starts inside me. So here's the challenge. <clears throat> what's going on in me? What kind of war or struggle is going on within me Maybe me and God, there's something I know God wants me to do, but I'm, I'm reluctant, I'm refusing, I'm not doing it. And, and that'll cause a ripple effect to other things around me and in my life. And if that's what it is, give in to God, because his way is going to be better for you. You believe that? Give in to God, start doing it his way, and you watch and see what he can do when you give it to him. And if it's something external, then give it to God. If it's with God, give in to him. If it's something else, give it to God prayerfully. Ask him what you should do to be the peacemaker. And one more thing here. Being a peacemaker is a calling for all Christ followers. For all Christ followers. There are several things I want to say to you about that. First, it's a calling involving the activity of bringing about peace, of making it happen. It's our calling. Look at what Romans 14, 19 says. Let us make, what's the next two words? Say it with me. Every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. So as Christians, we are to make what? Every effort to do everything that we can. Can you imagine Jesus up in heaven and looking down and saying, oh, wow, look at all of those sinful people and they're so stuck in their sin. It would be nice if somebody did something. Can you imagine Jesus doing that? No, he actually came down and did something, right? He took on flesh and blood like us. He took on our sin there at the cross so that we can be forgiven and have peace with God. And he calls us to be active, to actually make every effort. Okay, you're losing me here, come on. He actually calls us to make every effort to do what leads to peace. It's our calling, friends, every one of us. Jesus actually is God's first peace negotiator. He's the first peacemaker. And now he says we're blessed if we do that too. It's a calling. Now, some of you might say, but I'm the stubborn type. You know, like, I, I'll just wait it out. I'll wait till they give in. Let them come to me. Oh, my goodness. You know what? I think maybe God would have some of us go home today and take the initiative to bring about peace where there's a conflict. No, 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 no. Let them come to me. 
Their fault. They did it. The conflict started with them. Hmm. In your notes, write down Matthew 5 and Matthew 18. You know why? Matthew 5 says, if it's your fault, yeah, you need to go and make it right with them. But Matthew 18 says, if it's their fault, you need to go and make it right with them. What? <clears throat> you mean no matter whose fault it is, I still, as a believer, need to go and make it right? Yep. So don't ever. Yes, this is strong. Don't ever say, let them come to me, because you'll immediately be unbiblical, because God says, doesn't matter whose fault it is, you be the peacemaker, you go and make every effort, right? And as much as it depends on you, you go and make it right. Does that make sense? Do you like it? Nope. But it's what God says. Doesn't matter whose fault it is, we are to go and try to make it right, do everything that we can. So, what do you want today? I mean, do you want to win at home? Or do you want God's best there in your home and in your family? Do you want to win at workplace? Or do you want to do what's best, what God would have as best for you around you at your workplace? See, now dealing with the issues, that doesn't mean being brutally honest. And that, well, you, 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 you. No, 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 no. God says, speak the truth in love, not just being brutal. He says, instead, make every effort to bring about, to do what leads to peace. So peace doesn't just happen. We've got to work on it. It's active. It's not passive. He says, make every effort. So let me give a quick little summary here. Peace, being a peacemaker doesn't mean you just let go, compromise, compromise your values, compromise your beliefs No, for the sake of peace. No, no, not at all. Some things need to be addressed. It doesn't mean being brutally honest and hurtful. No, no, do it in love. But it means asking what I can do to bring about God's good for these people. And for me, for everybody involved, what's God's good? Let me change directions for a moment. We all have different personalities here, okay? And some of us are over here, some of us are over there. We're all different. Some people, and you, you, you'll know these people, you have them in your life, or maybe you're one of these people. There are some people who are naturally troublemakers. They like to stir the pot. They cause trouble. They heard a little story about somebody. They quickly run to tell them. Do you know people like that? If it's you, put up your hand. No, don't. You know people like that? On the other hand, there are some people who aren't troublemakers. They're peacemakers. They're trying to bring people together. And that's what God calls us to do. Are we people who light fuses? Or are we people who are, who are pulling out the fuses to literally defuse a situation? Which are we? Okay? You know, let me ask you. Is a demolition expert someone, you know, on the bomb squad? Is that somebody who sits at home and dreams of ways to keep explosives from going off? No, it's somebody who actually goes and defuses, pulls the fuse out of that bomb. True? After the first service, Mike Buckney came up to me and was talking about this. Um, he's a trained fireworks guy. Engineer. Let's call him an engineer. Fireworks engineer. Trained. And there are these huge competitions. I didn't even know that. And they're big, one of the biggest ones is at Niagara Falls every year. And... Um, a year ago today, the guy that taught him all about this, uh, they were down at Niagara Falls, and after the competition's done, and it's amazing and wonderful, and I guess different countries send their, you know, fireworks experts and stuff, the most dangerous job is not loading up the fireworks, it's not lighting up the fireworks, it's the guy who has to go and defuse the ones that didn't go off, because there are always some. Wow. He talked about this fellow that he's going to meet here this week. It's the one-year anniversary. Went, one of the foremost experts, and as he went to defuse one, it blew up. And Mike was describing all of the damage to his face and brain and everything that was going on. 
You know what? I think sometimes we're afraid to be peacemakers. We're afraid to like get in the middle of something and help people because we're afraid it's going to blow up and we're going to get hurt. Would you agree? But that's no excuse. God would call us at times to be that person, to be that go-between between them and him, which we'll talk about in a moment, or between them and that other person. He calls us to be peacemakers. But maybe at the, at the foundation, here's the question. Are you somebody who's lighting fuses, you know, disturbing things? Or are you somebody who is pulling out fuses, defusing situations as a peacemaker for Jesus? I think God would ask us that. Which am I? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. What does that mean, to be children of God in this case? What does it mean? There's a thing called the doctrine of reconciliation. Here's what it means. It's to bring about the peace, to negotiate a peace, a friendly settlement between people, to bring people together, to help them be reconciled when they're separated, reconciled together. And the Bible tells us that there is a war between sinful humans and a holy God. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, it says at various places that we are God's, before we're Christians, before we come and ask forgiveness, that we are his enemies. Yikes! That that we are alienated from him, that we are opposed to him by our lives and actions. Goodness, there's a war. We're his enemies. And God, what does he do? He sends Jesus to come, to join us, to take on flesh and blood like us, and to die there on the cross in our place so we can have our sins forgiven and be reconciled to God. It's amazing. God does that for us. It's amazing. He comes, negotiates a settlement. He's the first peacemaker, if you will. And now God wants you, here's Jesus, the Son of God. He wants you to be children of God as you too would be like Jesus, as you would too would help reconcile people to God. And when you do that, you know what God calls you? His ambassador. You're his ambassador to bring peace. Look at what he says in 2 Corinthians 5. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. And we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. God who made you and loved you, come back to God. Wow. You know what I like to do? I'd like to read you the whole passage that this verse comes from because it's amazing talking about all this stuff. So so follow along carefully. Paul says, this does sound familiar, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. I love that. Now, how did that happen? And the old is gone. The new has come. Yay. Thank you, God. How did that happen? All this is from God who reconciled us to himself. How? Through Christ. It happens through Jesus, right? And now he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We, Jesus is the peacemaker, us and God. Now we are the children of God too as we take that ministry on. What was it? That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. To which I say, don't you? God not counting our sins against us. Wow, maybe I'm a bigger sinner than you, I don't know. But I say, whew. Wow. The ministry of reconciliation. Not counting our sins against us. Why? Because Jesus paid for them. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation to share, right? We are therefore, here it is, God's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us, and we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I find that amazing. We're ambassadors for God to love people in Jesus' name, to negotiate peace in Jesus' name. It's not a matter, so it becomes not a matter of do you win or do they win, but what would God have that's the best for this situation for both you and me? That's what God would want. Let me ask you this. Let me wrap this up for a moment. Are there some battles going on inside you And because of what's going on on the inside, it's affecting what's going on on the outside. 
I mean, what are you fighting? What are you struggling with this morning? Well, what are you upset about? And it causes you to be dis- upset with others. Lynette and I had somebody this week who just, wow, it was, kind of shook our heads when this little encounter was done. And, and it was, you know what? He's upset on the inside and he's taking it out on us on the outside. You've seen that happen. And maybe you've been in the center of that what turmoil? What is there inside? And again, if it's between you and God, something you know God wants and you're reluctant or God wants you to do and you won't or stop, and you, you need to give in to God. Give it over to him. And if it's something on the outside, give it up to him. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you that gift of God's peace and to help you to be that peacemaker. Oil to smooth things between you and that person or those other people. In your notes, everybody have your notes? Every week as we've walked through this series, on the back, we've had an application project. I mean, how do I bring this home? What does this mean for me today? So what? How does this affect my life? And let me have you look at a couple of these this morning. Look at number three. Here's a question to ask. What robs me of a sense of God's peace? Now, it doesn't say who, because, hear me, no one can take away your peace with God. Okay? No one can do that. You might give it up because you're so mad. No one can rob you of that peace. Look at number four. What person with, the person with whom I sense the greatest conflict is, who might that be? The situation in my life where I feel the most conflict is, what is it? Now let me remind you, you cannot get away from conflict. You cannot get away from tension. So how do you become a peacemaker and how do you find God's peace? I want to close, if the uh, worship team would come, I want to close with a story and a song this morning that I want you to hear. This is the story of the most incredible sense of peace in the most unbelievable situation that you've ever heard. Certainly that I've ever heard. It's a story about a man named Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford. Now, this man was a lawyer. He was a lawyer in Chicago. And he was a wonderful, godly man, a strong, strong Christian man. He had invested money. He invested in properties all along the lakeshore, along Lake Michigan. It was great. He was doing well. Successful man, wife, family. And his son died. His only son died. He and his wife were distraught. I mean, it crushed them. It was terrible. And not only that, but on the heels of that came the great Chicago fire of 1871. Have you heard of it? Old Lady Leary lit a candle in the shed. When the cow kicked it over, she winked her eye and said, there will be a hot time in the old town tonight. You've never been to camp? You don't know that song? True story. The great Chicago fire burned down the whole city. And now Horatio Spafford and his wife lost everything. They had lost their son. Now they lost everything. Again, they were devastated. What will we do? What can we do? This is terrible. Well, well, they were friends of D.L. Moody, the great evangelist. And Moody had gone to England to preach to people in England. And Spafford and his wife said, you know what, let's, we need to get away, we need a break, let's, let's book passage on a boat, let's go over to England, we'll join D.L. Moody, that'll be a, just a change, you know, we can process our grief. So they took the train to New York, they had passage on a ship, he, at the last minute, got called to do some mass business, he put his wife and four daughters on the ship, and off they went, he's going to take the next ship. Halfway across the Atlantic, that ship ran into another ship and sunk. And all four of his daughters were drowned. Only his wife was rescued. And when they got to Ireland, they sent a telegram, a cable back, where she had only lots of news about the sinking, but she said two words to her husband, saved alone. Wow. What else? What else could happen? Well, he quickly got on the next ship that he could find. 
And that ship sailed across. <clears throat> and he had asked the captain, you know, to show me. And, and when they got to the spot where the previous ship had sunk, where his four daughters had drowned, he went to the side of the ship. He looked over. And sorrows like sea billows rolled over him. That sound familiar? And right there at that spot, in the middle of the deepest grief, lost all his kids, lost everything, he looked to God. And as he looked to God, he found God's peace. How do you find God's peace? I don't know what trouble, tension, turmoil you're in right now, but I bet it's not as great as what he went through that day. And yet, as he looked to God, he found God's peace. And he wrote this song that we're going to sing now. I want you to keep in mind as you listen to the words, what was happening? Because I want you to know that if he could find God's peace in all that tragedy, you can find it no matter what you're facing today too. Let's stand together and sing. God, thanks for your peace. It's well with my soul. (laughs) 